Thanks very much, Dennis. So as, assuming for the moment that the issue that we're addressing is the wider question of the union as a whole, and not just Scotland, then we need, I think, to address a set of criteria which will help us to identify the various issues that need to be addressed. And in your um, comments earlier on, before lunch, Dennis, uh, you asked the pertinent question. So what is it that holds a unit together? And why might we want to keep it? So here I think um, James Bryce, who is a constitutional analyst, um, as well as a practicing politician in the 19th century, his analysis I think is quite useful in identifying a rather fuller set of criteria that bind polities together or contribute to loosening those ties. And it's interesting, of course, that Bryce formulated his analysis at exactly the time when, during the Home Rule crisis in Ireland, that Dicey came up with his very different analysis. Indeed, to some extent, they were in competition with each other. So extracting from that, we can structure a discussion around, I think, four somewhat different forces in play that Bryce identifies. What he calls consent, right? He terms it also in another context, the readiness to submit and to follow, that's one. Two, material self-interest. Three, individual and collective rights. And fourthly, what he calls emotional attachment or sympathy. So each of these can either strengthen or weaken a union depending in part on the degree to which the centre is trusted to act in the best interests of all the component parts of the polity in good faith in each of those areas. So the crisis of the UK union, I suggest, is that trust in the centre to do so has significantly disappeared with regard to each of these issues. So the question for the centre and for those who wish to preserve the union is whether it's willing and capable of restoring that trust before it's too late. So not surprisingly, I'm thinking, and I was asked to address this in the Northern Irish context. But by the way, Northern Ireland um, is not a nation. But let's leave that to one side for the moment. Instead, I'll focus on Brexit. So Brexit has been an absolute game changer with regard to Bryce's criteria. So consent has been weakened both by the original decision to implement the referendum result in the absence of consent by Northern Ireland, and then by overriding a unionist opinion in the adoption of the protocol. Emotional attachment between the two parts of Ireland has been threatened in the interests of emotional attachment between Northern Ireland and England. The material self-interest of many in Northern Ireland has been reduced and individual rights protected by the European Convention on Human Rights consistently challenged and undermined where possible as part of the larger Brexit project. So what can be done? Well, the, the genius of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement was to recognize that by setting the issue of Northern Ireland in the broader European and island of Ireland contexts, the union paradoxically was capable of being strengthened rather than weakened. And it did this by addressing the full range of the forces that Bryce identified. The peace settlement well, went well beyond the issue of devolution, although well, that was one element in it. The problem has not been with the agreement, but with the extent to which the UK has been willing to take the logic of that agreement to heart and to follow it even when it went against short-term political self-interest in London. The agreement was also largely based on a significant degree of trust that word again, that both Ireland and Britain would honour their commitments without the need for heavy constitutional obligations to be put in play. So although the agreement is in the form in part of an international treaty, there are no legally binding dispute settlement procedures adopted internationally. In retrospect, and this is a critical point, that trust turns out to have been misplaced, given the experience of Brexit. And any future settlement, and I say this carefully, any future settlement will have to be considerably more legally re robust, I'm afraid, which leads then into a discussion of how to constitutionally entrench 
whatever settlement is negotiated in the future. For me, the utility of the discussions we're having today are actually to prepare the ground for a future unification referendum under Section 1 of the Northern Ireland Act. That question will be put, that will be put will be a binary choice, unification between Northern Ireland and Ireland or continued membership in the UK. We're therefore talking, again, referring back to Dennis's introduction, we're therefore really talking about six nations that we're considering today, not five, because the unification of Ireland is on the agenda. As part of the run up to such a referendum, the Irish government will have to formulate an offer as to what a united Ireland would look like. And we can anticipate that the UK government would want to indicate, a bit like before the Scottish re independence referendum, what for further reforms to the union would take place in order to capture the hearts and minds of a significant group of floating voters who will determine the outcome, among whom I would count myself, by the way. So in light of this, what would such an offer by the UK government look like? Well, one issue seems set to dominate, I'm afraid. If the Brexit mess continues, and there's no indication that it will not, a critical question will be how to resolve the conundrum of being out of the EU without at the same time wrecking the Northern Ireland economy and forcing a choice as to whether to be British or Irish as a binary choice. That means that any serious offer by, G, uh, by unionists in Britain, leave aside Ulster unionists, by Brit unionists in Britain, must revisit whether the UK as a whole must come significantly closer to the EU in order to reduce the significance of the UK EU border in Ireland and the GB Northern Ireland border down the Irish Sea. Tinkering with the institutional dimensions of devolution just will not cut it, I'm afraid. So to end, I'll I'd like to return to this issue of trust. So what's the relationship more broadly between trust and law, between trust and public law in particular? On the one hand, a traditional role of law is as a substitute for lack of trust. So think of contract law. So constitutional law could play a role in alleviating the current constitutional distrust between Northern Ireland and the centre. By the way, I should say that the most recent opinion poll that's been done on this shows that the only thing that unites both communities in Northern Ireland is distrust of the UK government. However, there's a problem here. To rely on constitutional law constraints requires trust, but trust in law, and trust in particular that the various parts will actually follow that law, even when it's not in their immediate self-interest to do so. And at the moment, and with regret, it becomes clearer by the day that UK governments, or at least this UK government, cannot be trusted to obey the law. So in that context, I couldn't, I'm afraid, disagree more with Michael um, in arguing that parliamentary sovereignty um, is, that restricting that parliamentary sovereignty is not necessary in any constitutional settlement. And in this, I agree entirely with Shona. That may have been the case prior to 2016, but it's certainly not the case now. Whether the UK government will be prepared to keep the manner and form restriction, as he put it, of, for example, Section 7A of the 2018 Withdrawal Act, if and when Article 16 of the Protocol is triggered in the new year, if that happens, will be a very interesting case study of the extent to which manner and form re requirements in the current day are likely to be kept. I personally have no faith whatsoever in current manner and form requirements um, if parliamentary sovereignty is kept. Thank you.